Uh, just like to test to see if uh, Scott Bennett's able to join us now. Scott, hi, are you there? Yes, Tony, I'm here with you. <laughs> right, you're right. I feel like cheering now. Uh, but anyway, before we finish with uh, talking to Scott Bennett, I just wonder what if you've got any contribution to make, Scott, about the um, uh, the discussion we're having there about energy and international energy and how the energy companies uh, and to what extent they have influence on our national policy. Martin was suggesting, perish the thought, that actually some of the energy policy is based around, or some of the wars are not based around moral issues. They're actually based around energy grabs. Well, I would absolutely concur with that uh, analysis. The wars are entirely generated by a, by a monetary agenda that is focused as oil as the commodity, as well as the gold stock that is uh, hidden in a lot of these countries. Um, the oil companies that are working in tandem with the defense contractors, with the politicians as the puppets that simply smile and nod and sign their name on the... Ex- on the uh, congressional legislation it's it's very much a corporate uh operation uh so i mean for example with somewhere like libya i mean that isn't actually known as a massive oil producer so what what, what's what's going on in some of these conflicts uh, scott well libya for example you you've got a destabilized country that was that was sort of a pain before and now it's become a bleeding ulcer now and it it's chalked up as serious ignorance by the U.S. policy and military makers or a serious uh, corruption of agendas and unconstitutional activities. I always would like to fall on the ignorant side, but it's not. They've gone into Libya. They've destabilized it. They've thrown out the the government. So you're going to have civil wars there between warring tribes and factions that that are very similar to what the United States experienced between the Sioux and the Apache and all these Indian tribes when they were fighting each other. The same applies over there in the desert. Only with Libya, you've got, uh, you've got a, a significant historical site. You do have certain reserves of gold that the Israelis have set up an operation to uh, secretly confiscate. And you now have uh, a mass exodus of, of uh, people leaving the north of Africa uh, through Libya to get into Europe because of the humanitarian suffering. That's what every Briton should be concerned about and outraged by is that the United States is going into these Middle Eastern company, countries causing chaos and sending the human uh, destruction over to Europe and specifically Britain. Britain, and, and I know Britain. I was born in Scotland. I have family in Britain. And I know Britain is the is the jewel of the European uh, continent with regards to freedom and capitalism and entrepreneurship and that's why all these migrants are struggling and dying to to reach its shores. Now look so, Scott you've you've been uh, at quite a, a high level in the US for example having meetings with Donald Rumsfeld people like that give us a bit of an insight into how these energy firms operate at the highest level because I know they have quite a lot of access don't they to top politicians top banks that kind of thing. Well, you have their own private security companies and intelligence sectors within the uh, energy companies. You've got um, a lot of money that is that is given for American elections. That, of course, is the driving force behind all of American political choices because you have a group that doesn't want to cede power. It, it uh, thrives on making you know, decisions in Washington, and these oil companies are all the all the too happy to, to comply. Uh, you've got a lot of think tanks that are funded by uh, big companies for their research projects. Um, so it's it's really follow the money. Uh, I would say what's what's what we're now experiencing with the Ukraine sector, for example, you see the energy. Um, the energy cabal beginning to assemble there, and that's why it was interesting to see the vice president's son uh, being appointed as one of the energy uh, liaisons to that firm. So the, the U.S., its, its energy theory is to drain all nations of the world until the U.S. is the last man standing with energy. Um, and they're, they're doing that. They're pursuing that policy in the Middle East, and it's it's enabled by Israel because Israel is benefiting from the destabilized countries because they're easy to loot, they're easy to plunder. Europe is suffering because all of the human wreckage is going over to Europe, 
over the Mediterranean to Italy, eventually to Germany. And, and the same will happen with Syria. When the U.S. eventually destabilizes Syria to go the way of Libya, you'll have all of the Syrian uh, exodus into Europe. So it doesn't lead anything good. This U.S. policy of destabilization has, has damaged uh, European and European interests, and British people should be outraged. But the, the energy companies drive the political process in a lot of these decisions in America, and it's enabled by the media. The media has, a, has an agenda for keeping people on the, on the edge of their seats, keeping them fearful so they'll tune in to their constant... Uh, feeding of, you know, hysterical propaganda about ISIS around every corner, uh, Muslims preparing to jump out of planes to uh, land in Texas and take over the United States one county at a time. But that's the that's the narrative that is that is postulated by by once reputable media institutions such as the New York Times and the Wall Street Journal uh, and the Washington Post. I saw it up close and personal. Um, and my, my experiences with the media. I wrote, when I discovered my whistleblowing issues involving Swiss banks and terrorist financing and Saudi donors and the Gulf states, I reported that up to all of the media institutions, asking, begging, pleading for them to investigate this, investigate me to discover all of the material is accurate, and not one media source did one single thing. They, they ignored it, they ran away from it, and uh, they attacked me for it. Why do you think that is, Scott? I mean, you know, you're a reputable guy, actually. You're, you know, apart from your housing violation that you were sent to jail for, which really does seem rather minor. I mean, you're yeah. an inside source for these media. Well, that that was the most fascinating thing about this tale is that that's the only reason they sent me to prison was because I was doing my job in the military and the defense contractor realm. I was finding money sources. I was finding shady behavior. I was seeing bribes, I was seeing corruption, I was seeing royal families uh, sending all the terrorists to other countries besides their own, and I saw a lot of secret, shady uh, U.S. intelligence money sources going to some of these operations. And when I started asking questions and making noise and, and filing reports up the military chain of command, the next thing I know, I'm stopped at a, at a front gate and I'm accused of filling out a housing contract wrong, and that was used to jettison me in the from the from my position, and then they prosecuted me uh, a short time later, and I thought it was a complete joke. But next thing I know, they throw me right in prison to silence me, but I just kept reporting what I kept discovering as a as a military officer. I kept reporting that I was seeing uh, connections and documents and persons that warranted U.S discovery and uh no no answers whatsoever now that is still in the legal process that will still be eventually uh brought out and uh and seen in the courts but it just shows there is no genuine interest in protecting the citizens of the united states and their safety and their security using intelligence that uh is actionable there that's a complete lie it's a complete hypocrisy because if they were they would have jumped on this material that Brad Birkenfeld and I supplied, and they never did. They hit it, they covered it up, they attacked me, they, they tried to discredit me as, as uh, you know, somebody impostering a military, uh, a military person. But it's all, it, you know, it was a very half-hearted, half, you know, half-wit attempt. It, it, it certainly wasn't successful, but it's, it's still in the process of discovery. But uh, Scott, Scott, I should stop you there? Sorry, but um, I mean, we, we, we've got uh, David Powell from Friends of the Earth in with us here. We've been discussing energy. I mean, what we want to see is a more system of, <clears throat> in Britain, and I imagine you do in the US, rather more like Germany, where uh, where energy is much more spread out with renewable energy, things like solar, wind power, this kind of thing, uh, that is not controlled by a t few tiny companies. From your insight, is there any real prospect of that in Britain and the US? Well, I would say one of the, the dangers that the U.S. faces is the monopolization of the, of the oil and energy industry. Uh, and they do have federal laws that are geared to preventing that, uh, but they've been relatively surrendered and inactive. I'd say, yeah, there's a very big danger when oil companies are, are paying academic professors at universities to do research and reinforce studies 
that uh, sort of toe the bottom line and, and set the, the agenda for fracking and things that have already been sort of proven to be environmentally damaging, but the intelligence is skewed. They're, they're corrupting it with uh, an agenda motive that's more monetary and corporate in, in their interest. Uh, how do you rectify it? You have to go through the political process and the information process. That's why the media is essential, but if they're not standing up as an institution, then it needs to be stood up by individuals, individuals such as yourself who are going out and creating websites and radio shows and TV shows and advertising the truth and trusting that people will gravitate to speakers with authority and speakers who are intelligent and reasonable, don't talk in sound bites and aren't afraid to be, uh, be aggressive and uh, expose, expose, you know, in interviews, these decision makers. Now, uh, David, uh, I wonder what your, your thoughts are about. I mean, this is it's quite a privilege to get access to Scott, who's who's been in the system in the US. He's seen how things can really work sometimes. Uh, do you ever feel a, a little bit uh, powerless? Because I mean, we as campaigners, I'm a campaigning journalist. You, you know, you're working for Friends of the Earth Environmental Campaign. Seems so far down the food chain that there's big decisions being made by energy companies, and a fantastic amount of money being spent on lobbying by the energy industry to create the laws that allow things like fracking i mean it's an an amazing thing in a way that fracking isn't happening just simply because uh the the oil price has been depressed in a way that's really lucky uh providential you know uh but but i mean i I, I wonder what your thoughts are about uh, how we roll back that power that's coming from above where politicians essentially aren't even really in the driving seat anymore we've just had our general election but we're wondering we're scratching our heads well will these guys really change anything Great question, and, and hello, Scott. Well, yeah, a bit of a long question. A bit of a long question. I'll give you a long answer if you like. Um, the, I think, actually, the, the only thing that's going to... Re- for, for a campaigning organisation, for campaigning journalists, is about getting people interested, getting people motivated and exercised, and people understanding what's going on. You know, the civil rights changes that we've seen around the world didn't happen because a couple of politicians fought for it. I mean, there were good politicians out there doing it, but they fought because people demanded it. Uh, but all of the major changes that we've seen have happened either through this, some sort of major shock or failing that, um, some sort of massive uprising of people. And that's what we're going to get. And what I think is really interesting, and that the uh, author Naomi Klein has done a huge amount of stuff on this recently is actually when you look at something like climate change and the energy system just like we've been talking about I think people are beginning to realise this isn't just about some obscure bit of environmental policy or something that's on the side fundamental to the way that we run our economies and our society are these massive problems climate is trade is economics is geopolitics and all of these things come together and I actually think the things that will sort out ultimately climate change and energy monopolies and all of these things are going to be something that looks a bit different they're going to be people demanding control of their energy system, rejecting fracking being put on them, and and things like that. And I think you're absolutely right, Tony, when you say it is remarkable that here in the UK we haven't had fracking, considering not just, you know, that the economic pressure that's coming from the big companies, but also how much this government wants to do it. But there is only one reason we haven't, and that's because people all around the country have said, no, no way, we don't want it. Sorry, Scott, but we've looked at America and we've seen what fracking has done to your beautiful country, and we've said we don't want that over here. And that gives me huge uh, encouragement, actually. And I think if we're going to have a conservative government for the next five years, if it lasts that long, I think we're only going to see more of that sort of thing like we did in 1992. I guess, uh, I mean, there's the price of energy being one thing that's, that's stopped fracking but it's also the uh, the lack of investors people are a bit hesitant about investing in something when they can see a whole army of protesters turning up on the site to stop it absolutely and you know this is this is it like i was saying 10 minutes ago uh, fracking is incredibly delicate in this country over in america there are these big decisions like keystone which i'm sure you can you know, the, the huge pipeline which i'm sure scott can talk about this massive decision that needed to be taken and still hasn't been properly taken as i understand it about whether you build this colossal great bit of infrastructure to take dirty oil from canada take it down through the states uh, over here it's fracking there but there are these everyday day-to-day decisions where protesters are out protesting people are out they're rejecting the idea of stuff being imposed on them which is having massive financial consequences because investors are getting nervous the stock prices are falling cost of capital is going up and people are going you know what it's not worth it and for a lot of investors particularly investors who will just go and put their money into something else thank you very much they're getting scared and they should be 
Um, OK, David, well, thanks very much for joining us. We're going to carry on talk to Scott a bit more about his uh, discovery of, uh, of Swiss banks financing terrorism in the Middle East through the CIA, through Saudi individuals, and how he was uh, thrown out of a job for telling his boss, actually just for doing his job, effectively. Uh, but thanks very much for joining us. Maybe you'd just like to finish and uh, tell us where we can find stuff from Friends of the Earth and what you're up to over the next few months. As always, yeah, thanks, Tony. The big thing we've got going on nationally is up in fracking in Lancashire. Lancashire is the, the pivotal point. It's our key stone it's the place where fight is going on find out more on our website uh, at www.foe.co.uk or call us up 0207490135 okay david powell economics researcher for friends of the earth thanks very much for joining us cheers Dave. Uh, and with you still scott um let's let's go on to uh, to talk about um uh, some of the experience that you've had. Uh, I mean, you, you were saying that you were targeting, you are doing psychological warfare as part of uh, the, the U.S. Army. Can you tell us how uh, psychological warfare works? Well, <laughs> yeah, it's sort of an interesting segue because one of the things I was going to share with you and David just before you left on the environmental level, that's been a huge psyop. That's been a huge psychological operations. And I, I think it's been done poorly as all psychological operations in the United States have, have been very pathetic, I think, in, in their design, but the environmental PSYOP has been negative. It's been uh, fear-based. It's been uh, dreading the inevitable melting of the glaciers, death of the polar bear, uh, the green plants will all wither and die, blah, blah, blah. And that's a very fear-based motivation, and that's, that only reaches a certain action trigger. Instead, the truth, if, if Britain really wants to reestablish itself and perhaps even reclaim some of its empire and information, it needs to be the positive source of environmental intelligence. It needs to be the, the uh, productive, creative steward of the environment. And putting, I mean, it, you can get exaggerated, but that's what PSYOP is all about, exaggerating the imagination so people are overloaded with feelings and emotions, and those trigger cognitive choices and physical uh, actions. And those, that PSYOP material for the environmental thing, for example, uh, you see that in, uh, for example, homes that resemble the hobbits, uh, green trees and green environment and children playing in flower fields and, and Star Trek sort of organized uh, technology. Things that give people a hopeful anticipation of the future if they follow the choice of intelligent environmental uh, operations and stewardship, rather than uh, you better stop driving, you better stop cooking, and you better stop doing all this stuff, or else you're going to suffer and you're going to be you know, in a world full of ashes and gray smoke. I think People what you're saying, think. effectively, Scott, there is accentuate the positive, eliminate the negative. I'd just like to bring old Labour Oxford economist Martin Summers in there because, I mean, we're talking about some big stuff here. It's like who really runs the world and why? And a lot of it has to do with energy, doesn't it? It does. Well, but it's, it's also well hang on, Scott, you were going to say something there? No, 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 please go ahead. Come on, Martin. Well, it's also got to do with, uh, with financial manipulations. Uh, the petrodollar is, is the key T-stone of the international system. In other words, the, the agreement between the US and the Saudis that essentially oil will be traded in dollars, which means that you know, poor countries, for example, in order to uh, buy their imports, have to have dollars in order to do so. And of course, the the Libyans were trying to develop uh, the Libyan gold dinar as a potential alternative. Um, so the, the Iraqis were talking about trading their oil in euros before they were invaded. And um, and now we've got things like the Asian Investment Bank that's been set up uh, in defiance of, of U.S. policy. Uh, the, 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 the tectonic plates are moving, but it's the relationship between energy and finance, which I think is the key, not just energy on its own. Yeah, I couldn't agree more. Um, Scott, yeah, give us give us a bit of a, a, an insight though into particularly how the uh, you you saw. I mean, because you were working in this in this area, what kind of operations you were doing against the Muslim population? Because I know you were um, you were actually recruited because of your background in advertising. Maybe you can explain a bit about that and how that was adapted by the military. Yeah, well, I had I had entered the fold back in uh, 2000 when I went to Britain and worked with some uh, interesting characters from Oxford Intelligence, uh, MI6, and uh, some USAID CIA agencies on 
foreign direct investment, uh, economic development in Eastern Europe as well as uh, the Pacific. And my, uh, my background academically and from a theory point of view was cultivating Islamic mindsets to be receptive for economic development, business, capital, uh, prosperity, generating uh, small micro business loans to get people doing something other than war. Uh, whether it's falafel stands or camel breeding or digging oil out of the sands or doing high tech, doing uh, computerization or, or offshore calling, Think, things of any description that an indigenous population might have a proclivity to, uh, I was developing communications and uh, materials that would be used to cultivate that. It was sort of like going into a brownfield and trying to turn it green. It had been brown from... Well, U.S. intervention, U.S. coup d'etats for the past 50 years, and all sorts of other colorful uh, geopolitical activities. And I was trying to go in and, and purify a lot of that soil, purify the mentality and, and the uh, identity. Anyway, that's a long way of saying that's how I started in 2000. 2001 hit with the very colorful, if not false flag, of uh, the 9-11 attacks. And I was in my doctorate. And I then put off joining the military and continued to serve in the Bush administration. And I got wrapped up in uh, foreign direct investment and Bush domestic policies. But I got roped into the Pentagon defense contractor establishment because they were looking for people to do psychological warfare. And my work was very almost the kissing cousin of psychological warfare. It was advertising. It was strategic communications. It was psychological persuasion. It was religious uh, intuition and, and taking the religious impulses of the Muslim mind and channeling it in a, uh, a positive capitalistic way. But of course the thing is, Scott, is that that's happened in the opposite direction completely with ISIS. So what's got been going on there? Well, that that's, was the biggest frustration I had from, from the very beginning is I was trying to go down the right road and I kept being sidetracked. I kept being stopped. I kept being forbidden. And then eventually I was attacked and imprisoned for it. And, and I mean, I was at the highest levels of the information counterterrorism world. I was at the State Department and Special Operations Command and U.S. Central Command. I had a top secret SCI clearance and I worked with who I thought were the best and brightest people, and I found it very sorely deficient. The smartest guys that I met were British that came over and were contractors for the State Department in cultivating uh, strategic communications in Afghanistan and Iraq. And I, I found them very refreshing because they could think outside the box and they had the, the encyclopedia of history as their foundation for building communication campaigns. They had the British Empire and the East India Company and the indigenous uh, uh, research on how to deal with these cultures. And the U.S. was very shallow and very, uh, very one color uh, inclined. And can, you, can you give us an idea of uh, maybe what one or two of the kind of campaigns you were running? Just to give us an idea of what this actually means on the ground, the work you were doing and how it was expressed and how the public would come across it. Well, yeah, none of it's classified. Uh, I only discuss unclassified stuff, but uh, some of it was developing comic books that I that uh, attacked the Islamic radical, the Islamic terrorist mind who was looking to, well, currently ISIS. This was back in 2008, uh, 2009. We produced material uh, when I was at Booz Allen Hamilton with Colonel Jeff Jones, who was a, a very brilliant thinker. He was a colonel in psychological operations, and uh, him and I put together a comic book idea that uh, was going to be geared towards a certain indigenous population so that over 10 years you would generate a following, and you would have a 10 years from a young kid who was 10 years old to 20, you could really gain ownership over a lot of his uh, loyalties and his, and his identity as intelligent and, and well-founded as an advertising campaign as that was, the entire military intelligence and political establishment rejected it. And now, you know, like seven, eight years later, they're now starting to explore what we proposed back in 2007, 8, and 9. Well, you know what this makes me think is that uh, some of the 
uh, campaigns, the uh, psychological warfare, or the just generally the milieu in Saudi Arabia, the Wahhabism, all that kind of thing. Imagine that there were similar campaigns that have been running for a decade or longer that have actually tried to persuade people to have the mindset to join ISIS, even. Well, that's that's the that's the the craziest thing is that you have that, and you have the the uh, ISIS camp that was that came out of the the Wahhabist uh, Gulf nations. And yet the U.S. is allied at the hip with those Gulf nations. You just saw the news report I sent you this morning where it's reported Obama is standing up and basically declaring uh, to stand with all these Gulf nations in any sort of uh, military uh, conflict or exercise. He's basically, def- he's basically proclaiming war but doing it quietly. And Americans don't see that. The media spins it in a completely different direction, as if we're assuming a defensive posture. We are not assuming a defensive posture. We are continuing, we are doubling down on our offensive posture. And the, the problem is the U.S. policy, the U.S. military, and the U.S. energy establishment looks at the entire Middle East like a shanty town, like a bunch of bums living under a freeway under tents, as you've seen with these African migrants who are going into France. That's how the U.S. views a lot of these people in the Middle East and their regimes and their governments. And what do they do? They go in and they wipe out the tents and plant little new ones and try and jockey for power and influence. And then you have the religious Wahhabists who stand up and say, thank you very much for the guns and the weapons and the ammunition. And they do it very persuasively. That's, that's one of the most brilliant things they've done, is they have effectively tapped into the U.S. policymaker, like John McCain. He's, he's a good example. They've tapped into John McCain's latent personality dysfunctions, which is peculiar in particular to the American culture and the American identity. Uh, in a country, America has its own characteristics of uh, sort of, Marital instability, high rate of divorce, family dissolution. Um, it, it, it does not share a lot of the conservative family impulses that really are prevalent in Eastern Europe or Russia or the Middle East. Uh, and I saw that up close and personal. And the uh, John McCain's and Lindsey Graham's, who, I mean, Lindsey Graham has all sorts of dysfunctionalities. Uh, the, the, the ISIS fighters have come alongside and seduced the McCain and Lindsey Graham personalities. They've spoken like warm butter. They've been charming. They've been a uh, little, you know, smiley, happy, petting people and uh, ingratiate themselves like little servant boys in uh, Lawrence of Arabia, if you will. And that just pets the ego the right way. And John McCain and Lindsey Graham and these others walk away feeling more humanly fulfilled. They feel this warm, fuzzy uh, emotion, and that guides their policy choices. So it's not about logic. It's not about, it's not about intelligence. It's not about analyzing the, the culture and the personality profiles and the political history and the economic viability of a country and a region. Uh, it's all about emotion and love and, and the promises of these, these ISIS Wahhabi types who have as their war agenda deceive them with every stratagem of war. Uh, Scott, where is this going to end? Just, we've got about another minute to go, but can you just tell us where are we heading? Well, you know, unfortunately, it, it's, it's not going to be turned, um, I think, by the current American political establishment. And, the, and Britain may, I mean, it, it, it may call uh, Cameron to be pulled out, but you're going to have an increased role in Russia and uh, Syria and I think China in pushing back on the Western operations. And Europe is going to incline to go with Russia, China, and Syria. I think they're going to abandon the U.S. Uh, allegiance. They're going to do it quietly and softly and gradually. But they're going to pull away because it's not in their best interest to continue this war operation, especially in the next six months when we see a mass exodus of people from Africa and the Middle East starting to swarm into the Mediterranean in Europe. I think that's only going to increase as long as the instability lasts and there's no, there's no infrastructure. 
And uh, we saw that in Iraq, the whole middle class left, left Iraq. The same thing is going to happen, you know, in, in Syria. The Wahhabist nations, you, you could have a, a Iran and Saudi Arabia be the trigger point for a U.S. military engagement, which, which could be very, very, very damaging. So, and also, uh, I suppose another final question, if you want, though, is someone that's worked in, in psychological warfare, psychological operations, Scott, uh, for people just kind of trying to make sense of the world, watching what's going on, on TV, watching the news, that kind of thing. What guidance have you got for them for actually reading behind the headlines, between the lines? You have to be educated and intelligent and know the, the research and the history of the, the target audiences. You have to know the difference between the tribes and the cultures and their, their religious beliefs and their, their, their whole history. Uh, and sadly, a lot of the American and, and Western NATO uh, people do not really fully understand that. And they're, they're blown by profit motives. They're blown by money from U.S. Uh, promises and and uh, I mean, CIA operations and Swiss banks, all of that stuff that I reported, they're, uh, they're driving a lot of this agenda. I, I'm hopeful that the American people will wake up and, and choose a much more restrained policy, will change gears, will get back onto a peace advancing agenda rather than war, because it's, it's decimated our economy and it's decimated our reputation. I don't know any Middle Eastern country whose people have a positive feeling for Britain or the United States or any European at this point. And look at Russia. There's a prime example. Russia is like 80, 90 percent of its people are, are very negative towards uh, the U.S. and NATO for very good reasons. I mean, we've, we've given them reason to. Um, the Wahhabist Gulf nations, Saudi Arabia, Bahrain, Qatar, Kuwait, they're all gearing towards Iran and Israel is gearing towards Iran, and the U.S. is gearing towards Iran. Uh, I don't think Russia and China will let that happen because they'll know they're the next one to fall if Russia, if, if Iran turns into a Syria or Iraq. Okay, Scott Bennett, former psychological warfare officer. Uh, you, uh, we had a little bit of an interview with you from another show last week, and it's very happy to have you with us this week, Scott. Scott Bennett, thanks very much for joining us here on the Politics Show. Thank you, Tony. Made in Bristol. This is BCFM 93.2. Yeah, so that was Scott Bennett there. Martin Summers. um, Let's go on now to talk a bit about uh, kind of what Scott was talking about in a way. And that is the uh, 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 problem we have with our mainstream press not telling us stuff. And uh, there's this documentary you pointed out to me before the general election, which is called My Damn Massacre. We've not seen it here in Britain at all, and yet it goes into real detail, doesn't it, uh, as to what actually happened in February last year at the Maidan Square, and 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 does the obvious thing, what you think of the obvious thing, what we used to get on the TV here in Britain, and that is goes and talks to the police officers who were shot at, the ones who were survived, some who were shot and went through hospital, had bullets removed, etc., uh, and I think it, psychological warfare isn't just uh, bending people's minds. It also involves uh, acts of violence, which are then spun. And what the film documents is that the shooting of both police officers and liberal protesters was not carried out by the previous Yanukovych regime, but carried out by elements connected to the current regime, uh, specifically Pravi sector militants who've probably been trained in Poland with the latest information that we have. Uh, And they shot both police officers and protesters as a basis for running uh, an armed military coup against the democratically elected government, however corrupt it might have been. Okay, so let's hear an extract from that documentary now. November 2013. Ukraine President Yanukovych is presented a trade deal with the European Union, a deal which would presumably lead to economic prosperity and take Ukraine under the umbrella of Europe. A miracle didn't happen, and European Union leaders and Ukraine have, as expected, failed to sign an historic free trade deal after a last-minute U-turn from Kiev. Ukraine has not signed the association agreement with the EU after all. Ukraine refuses to sign the association agreement with the EU. But Yanukovych rejected their offer and eventually settled for a more economically favorable deal with Russia. There have been reports of medics being deliberately targeted. The clashes lasted for hours and led to deaths on both sides. The protesters are running their wounded back on stretchers. They were gunned down, mercilessly. 
Chinese gunmen who fired on both police and protesters in the Maidan. What does the evidence suggest? From where I was, I could hear quite clear Mr. Lusenko yelling on stage that was Khrushchev. In the morning, you will have something to fight the police with. We can tell now that they were shot from the Ukraine hotel 100%. Even those videos on the internet, for example, that bright flash, a shot, and a protester is hit, another flash. It's a shot made from the Ukraine hotel, for sure. So that was the extract from the uh, documentary actually made by a US filmmaker, Hollywood filmmaker, uh, and yet still not shown here in Britain, Martin. Yeah, well, I think the key thing that people have to realise is that what probably happened there, well, the evidence suggests, is that a group of snipers from the Hotel Ukraine shot both police and protesters as the basis of a military coup, and that NATO has a track record of carrying out such atrocities. Similar things happened in Syria and in Venezuela. OK. Uh, also, uh, this topic was discussed by our great friend Daniel Aganza uh, when he was speaking to Julian Charles on The Mind Renewed. You have a group of demonstrators on a public square and then you just fire on them and kill them and say, you know, the government did it and then you can you can topple the government. I mean, that was done in Ukraine in, in on February 21, 2014. That's something we all witnessed. That's not even 12 months ago. And now the question is, obviously, who did the firing? Who were the snipers? And today we know, those people who research uh, secret warfare, that these snipers on the Maidan in Kiev, that they killed both demonstrators and policemen. So that's strange, you know. Uh, mm-hmm. Obviously, if, if you come from this group of, of research that I do, you, you wonder, I mean, um, how, why did the acting president shoot his own policemen? And I don't believe it, really. I mean, usually they don't do that. And what you then see is that on that day, the government of Yanukovych fell and the new government of Poroshenko came into place. And the big change here is that Yanukovych was the guy of Moscow. Okay, He was a Russian-friendly dictator or oligarch. And now Poroshenko is the guy of Washington. He's a, he's a Washington-friendly dictator or oligarch. And, you know, these things are not things of the past. They are things that concern us today because secret warfare is not something that stopped. I very much think uh, that secret warfare is something that we need to take into account if we look at international politics. The author of NATO's Secret Army about Operation Gladio, that's Danielle Eleganza there, finishing our show today. Sorry we didn't have time for Catherine Albrecht. Microchipping will do next week and the cancer dangers of it. Uh, also, Levelers Day tomorrow. Do make it up to Burford if you can. I'm Tony Gosling. Our show site is www.thisweek.org. Dot UK. Do please join us for Friday Drive Time next week and don't let those banksters get you down. BCFM is an award winning community radio station for Bristol, bringing you national news on the hour. Live from the Sky News Centre. From the Sky News Centre at 7, commuters face a miserable end to the Maybank holiday later this month with the threat of the first national rail strike for around 20 years. Members of the RMT union are walking out for 24 hours in a row over pay.